So I'm standing in front of an 80 meter fig tree in a Ugandan forest. In front of me, there are two ropes that rise into the canopy. I can't see the anchor points, they're so high. And then my mission on this particular day is to climb up those ropes, get into the canopy, haul up a four foot by four foot steel tree platform, attach it to the tree, and get back down this tree before the troop of chimpanzees that are, arrive for their daily feed come around the corner. Now the timing is crucial because these chimpanzees have never seen a human in their tree before. And we've spent the last three to four weeks filming these chimpanzees, hunting very proficiently in trees just like this one, other primates, ripping them to shreds, making a meal out of them. So you can understand that we might be a little bit nervous about what might happen to us, given that they've never seen a human being in their tree before. So I set up, I get up my ropes, I get to the top of the tree, 30 minutes later, I'm attaching the platform, I'm jumping up and down on it to make sure it can hold the weight of Bill, my cameraman, and his camera. And just as I'm about satisfied with the job that I've done, the radio cackles. Jeff, the chimps are here. Now, I should explain that I'm the least experienced person in this team at this particular point. The chimpanzee research scientists are on the ground. Bill, who's very experienced, the cameraman, he's on the ground. So I get on the radio and I say, OK, what shall I do? And there's a silence. And I can hear the hoot calls of excited chimpanzees coming through the forest as they're heading towards this great big tree full of food. The radio starts up again. It says, we don't know. So I think, OK. <laughs> what are my options here? I can descend these ropes and end up freaking out these chimpanzees and they might never come back. One option. I can stay put. Just go with the flow, see what happens. But what if they become aggressive? I mean, chimpanzees are very, very strong, very well adapted to this environment. And on a number of occasions when I've been on the ground, they've run past and slapped my leg and it really hurts. <laughs> and I don't want that to happen at the top of a tree. But before I can make any sort of informed judgment, the chimps have started coming up the tree. I'm still running through options. I could throw myself on my ropes and hope that they hold if things get a bit crazy up there. But as I do, and I'm trying to think about what to do, the chimps rise up through the tree and they surround me in pretty much a perfect circle, 360 degrees, 80 foot up in the air. And they get on with their feeding. It becomes really apparent very quickly that not only is my presence acceptable, but they have a complete indifference to me being there. I'd spent so much time and worry and effort thinking about myself and about how I would be the center of focus in this particular situation that it hadn't even occurred to me that these chimpanzees might not care. And they didn't. And that indifference was at first shocking. You know, I mean, as humans, we all like to think we're the center of our own universe. But after a while, that indifference became incredibly exhilarating. These chimpanzees were taking an almost egalitarian view of their environment. They cared no more about me than they did about which fig they were going to eat next, which ant was going to crawl up one of their legs, whether the hornbill that was on the branch above was going to steal a fig and get away with it. And that view of the whole that these chimpanzees had, without me at the center, completely changed the way that I see the natural world. 
just as I was having this epiphany at the top of this tree, as if to mark my complete insignificance, a steady shower of hot, sticky, wet, fig-infused chimp urine <laughs> just started pouring down on me on my 4 by 4 platform. And I had no, uh, no option but just to take it. <laughs> now, since that moment, I have traveled the world and seen the same curiosity and the same interest and fascination from other species of their environment as a whole, from wolves in the Arctic right down to penguins in the Antarctic. And on a number of occasions, I've also experienced that indifference. And the key thing, though, is that I see that curiosity and that fascination for the whole much, much closer to home. I see it in my own children on a daily basis. I, whenever they're released into the garden, or whether they're released into a woodland, they go screaming past nature's best advertisements. The bluebell wood, the daffodil, the giant oak, majestic oak tree. And they come back to me holding the most innocuous and the most unremarkable seed head, bit of bark. But crucially, they come back holding it with such eagerness and such wonder, it rivals any Victorian explorer of age. So if we all have that fascination ingrained within us, innately, about treating the natural world with equality, then what's going wrong? Our culture, our adult culture, is increasingly fetishizing the large, iconic, glamorous predators, the beautiful ungulates, the fascinating primates. Time and time and time again, we train our telephoto lenses and our televisions and our attention on the same couple of dozen of species. We award prizes to photographers who very skillfully take beautiful portraits of the same 12 animals year after year after year after year. And that worries me because by being so blinkered to the beauty of the natural world as a whole, we could stand to lose it all and not even notice. Now, when I was having my urine-soaked epiphany at the top of this tree, <laughs> being completely ignored by a troop of chimpanzees, I became increasingly aware of hundreds and hundreds of tiny, tiny, tiny little insects, and they were burrowing into the figs. And these are fig wasps. And fig wasps are one of the most impressive of nature's wonders, a truly remarkable animal. Now, figs have evolved to put their flowers within the body of the fruit. And fig wasps have evolved to have inverted mouth parts and hooked legs, the females have at least, and they burrow into the figs in search of the flower to lay their eggs. Now, when a female fig burrows into a flower, it loses its wings, it loses its antennae, such that when it's done, it can't reach another fig. It only has one go. So she lays her egg inside the fig. The larvae develop, but crucially, the male larvae develop first. And they go on to fertilize female wasps. And the female wasps then develop at exactly the same time as the male part of the fig flower starts producing the maximum amount of pollen. 
so that when these females have reached their point of maturation, they exit the fig covered in pollen and head to go and find another fig and the cycle starts again. Now this millions of years of evolution that's gone into this beautiful symbiotic relationship is almost the cornerstone of the entire habitat that I was sitting in. There are thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of species which are reliant on this relationship between this fig wasp and this fig. And the chimpanzees wouldn't be there if this relationship didn't happen. In fact, one might argue that because in our evolutionary history, the ability to eat figs and therefore to hunt, because the energy that you get from figs gives you the ability to take on much more energetic uh, roles, such as hunting, might have even led to our own evolutionary path. So in some weird way, I was there to film the chimpanzees simply because this wasp had an association with this fig. Now, I find that absolutely amazing. The idea that it's the environment the whole, as a whole that counts and not the apex animal, the chimpanzee, that really matters. Now, the conservation world have been using the idea that the whole is greater than the sum of its parts for a long time now, for a few decades. They've been putting forward biome-specific targets which look to preserve specific ecosystems. There's an entire conservation movement which is very prevalent and very present right now to do just that. But conservation movements are nothing without the passion that people bring to the equation. NGOs and governments cannot achieve anything unless we public believe in the targets that they are putting forward. So what I'm saying is we now hold a responsibility, all of us here, to find beauty in the everyday, to find passion for the small things as well as the big things, to bypass the iconic, take off our blinkers, and open our eyes to the beauty that the natural world has to offer at every step. And then, and really only then, have we got a chance to save this remarkable planet of ours. Thank you.